So thank you all for joining. And today I'm going to discuss about um, issues that are associated with research on uh, climate and health, specifically pregnancy health. So um, I'm going to start by um, discussing a little bit about the direct effects of uh, climate in uh, human health, but specifically pregnancy and child health. Then I'm going to discuss about pregnancy as a very unique period to evaluate time-varying exposures. Uh, so we will discuss about the specific characteristics that pregnancy has that makes it a little bit more challenging to study uh, environmental exposures in general uh, and climatic factors more specifically, which have been the focus of several other uh, investigations in the last five years. Then I'm going to discuss about related biases, uh, the biases related to the data sources that we use or the methods we use for climate change and pregnancy health, and propose some future directions or some solutions that people should be thinking about when they are uh, evaluating associations that have to do with time varying exposures and pregnancy health. So this is a map that shows uh, the US 2023 billion dollar weather and climate disasters. So in 2023, we can see that uh, there were 28 confirmed weather and climate disaster events with losses exceeding more than 1 billion each to affect the United States. And these events include one drought event, four flooding events, 19 severe storm events, two tropical cyclone events, one wildfire event, and one winter storm event. And overall, these events resulted in the deaths of almost 500 people and had significant economic effects on the areas that were impacted. Just for a comparison, in 2022, there were 18 such events. And the 1980 to 2023 annual average of those events was just 8.5, while the annual average for the most, five, uh, most recent five years is 24.4 events. So it's very clear that these events are going to become even more frequent, and we need to find ways to study them. Now, this figure that I show here provides a 10-year estimate of fatalities related to these extreme events from 2004 until 2013, as well as estimated economic damages from 58 weather and climate disaster events with these losses exceeding $1 billion. And these statistics are indicative of the human and economic costs of extreme weather events over this time period. We can see that the majority of deaths is attributed to um, um, heat waves, but we have all the extreme weather events uh, contributing to, um, to death toll around the years. And climate change is going to alter the frequency, the intensity, and the geographic distribution of some of these extreme events, and that will have consequences for exposure to health risks from these extreme events. And the trends and future projections from some extremes, including tornadoes, lightnings, and windstorms, were not quite you know, certain about uh, projection studies for these events because they're not that frequent, but they are certainly expected to increase in frequency. And people have been saying like, yes, but the climate has always been changing. This is something that has been happening throughout the decades uh, in humanity. And this is true, but it didn't happen at this rate. So this is a plot that shows um, the yearly temperature anomalies from 1880 to 2019 in comparison to the 1951 to 1980 mean, as recorded from the NASA, the NOAA, and the Berkeley Earth Research Group. Um, the temperature anomaly um, tells us actually whether the temperature observed for a specific place and time period, for example, a month, a season, or a year, was warmer or cooler than a reference value, which is usually a 30-year average and by how much. So we can clearly see that the trend is, the slope of this line is much steeper than the previous year. So the rate of acceleration of increasing temperatures is, is much bigger than the previous years. And the 2023 global temperature recap, um, we can see that the 2023 was the world's warmest year on record. And we can see in this graph how uh, temperature uh, has been increasing throughout the years. And uh, there have been 47 years since Earth's had a cooler, uh, colder than average year. So we can see that the rising temperatures are clearly a big problem on how we um, address climate change and climate change and health uh, more specifically. 
Um, now, I don't want to be uh, pessimistic. So um, uh, if we don't do something about it, uh, this trend is going to become even worse in the years to come. So if we uh, do not do anything regarding the emission cuts, which is a very important um, uh, focus area of uh, climate change mitigation, yes, these temperatures are going to rise, but we can see that we have uh, a much better uh, projection of the future temperatures if we do substantial cut in emissions. So the good news is that we can do something about it today. There are things that we can do today to stop this increasing trend of temperature. Now, all this data come from uh, scientists that are studying uh, climatology or um, uh, climate change more specifically, but all these um, uh, all these points and all the concerns about climate change gradually reach the clinical audience. So there has been interest from major clinical journals on studies that are looking uh, in association in the association between um, climate change, uh, environmental factors, climate change more specifically. And uh, here I present two journals that are uh, focused on women's health. Uh, so there was recently a call for papers from the British Journal of Obstetrics and Gynecology, uh, other journals as well, the International Journals in Gynecology and Obstetrics, major journals from their clinical audience. They're asking for more studies uh, to document the effects uh, of climate change in pregnancy and child health. And very recently, JAMA introduced the JAMA Climate Change and Health Series. And um, it's a part of the what we call JAMA Insights. And these articles are, um, uh, they focus on insights of, for clinical practice. They are usually shorter than a full uh, JAMA paper uh, with one table and figure. And in this new insight series, um, the proposed manuscript should cover topics about how Climate change has affected human health, focusing on rigorous evidence relevant to practicing clinicians. Uh, so we see that this topic of climate change and health is reaching gradually a, a larger and larger audience. Of course, I'm pretty sure you are all aware of the NIH Climate Change and Health Initiative, and they have released their strategic framework on what they will do in the next uh, 10 years to uh, address the issues of climate and health. And just last week, we had the uh, CAFE conference, which was a conference that was organized uh, by um, Harvard University and uh, BU and uh, brought together scientists that are doing climate change and health research, uh, not only from an epidemiologic point of view, but a policy making point of view. Uh, we had many people from the municipalities to see what is going on in a local level. So NIH is putting a lot of effort on mitigating the health, of, on uh, doing research on the health effects of climate change. And there are certain pillars that are of specific interest. Of course, health effects research, uh, so scientific investigation of the influence of climate change on health outcomes, including spatial and temporal scales, different pathways, mechanisms, and risks of specific times of vulnerability across the lifespan. Health equity is another very important pillar for for the NIH um, intervention research, um, science that provides the evidence base for development and implementation of effective strategies to prevent the disease and disability and promote health associated with climate change and training and capacity building. So we see that there is a very comprehensive framework through which many disciplines collaborate and trying to find, to document certain risks and find solutions for these risks. This initiative um, has described, and it's not only the NIH initiative, but this is something that um, has been described in all uh, the aspects of uh, climate change and health. We all know that there are direct and indirect effects from climate change to human health. So, uh, of course, the increased temperatures are expected to um, have effects on diseases that are associated with increased temperatures, cardiovascular disease, asthma, but even other more specific pregnancy-related uh, diseases such as preterm birth, gestational diabetes, gestational hypertension, and many others. Uh, so the exposure pathways through which these effects are manifested are either uh, extreme heat. Uh, we know that uh, climatic factors do affect air quality, so this is another uh, area that is expected to um, have worsened results. 
uh, reduced food and water quality. Uh, so this is more of like indirect effects of climate change. Uh, we know that the um, food distribution chains are going to be affected, but the food itself, how it's cultivated, uh, is going to change as well uh, based on uh, projections uh, for climate change. We will have a lot of changes in infectious diseases, and this is another very important topic, especially for pregnancy. And because of these extreme weather events, we have a lot of population displacement. And as I said, this, uh, this can have direct effects on health, physiological effects on health that can um, be associated with different diseases. But indirectly, uh, the stress associated with all these extreme weather events, the economic burden, uh, the difference, uh, the changes that are expected in food and water and vector-borne diseases are going to have a significant impact on, uh, on health. And specifically for vector-borne diseases, and uh, this has been a large area of focus in the previous years, uh, there have been projections that the warming temperatures are going to expose more than 1.3 billion new people to the Zika virus by 2050. So we understand that this is going to be a big threat for pregnancy. We all remember what happened um, a few years ago back when the Zika epidemic was ongoing, uh, where there were detrimental effects in the fetuses. So things are more complicated than, than we believe uh, regarding climate change. And um, several uh, efforts have been made to um, establish the risks in what we call vulnerable populations. Um, this is a graph that uh, comes from the Lancet uh, 2022 report, the Lancet Countdown. And we can see that uh, in this report, only uh, people over the age of 65 and infants were uh, characterized as vulnerable populations to heat waves. And this graph here shows um, the absolute change in millions in the number of heat wave percent days experienced by vulnerable groups from 1986 to 2005 as a baseline by human developmental index group um, and the WHO region. And the values are presented as a four year moving average here. So we see that there is indeed an increasing trend uh, in these, the days that somebody experiences uh, both in the uh, all human developmental index and actually the highest human developmental index has higher risks and in all uh, WHO regions with Africa and West Pacific to have the worst risks. Uh, so we can see that pregnant individuals have only recently been included among the groups that are most vulnerable to the heat stress. And it will take time for that recognition to translate into action. Studies in 2011 and 2015, for example, showed that the large majority of the heat wave response plans in the European Union countries have not identified pregnant women as a high-risk group. And the public also appears largely unaware of the risks of heat exposure during, during pregnancy. So uh, this is something that we have been focusing on. And given that we know that the effects of climate change on children's health start uh, before birth, uh, we know that many of the exposures of the harmful environmental exposures that happen uh, in the in utero life can be associated with direct effects in utero, such as intrauterine growth restriction, prematurity, low birth weight, altered development and programming, or different epigenetic changes that can be passed on. But it does set the stage for future disease, either in childhood, neurodevelopmental disorders, cognitive deficits, um, or other disorders that are diagnosed later in life, in adolescence, or even in adulthood. So, it has been associated with uh, cardiovascular disease, with higher BMI, uh, or other metabolic problems that uh, can be uh, seen either in um, adolescence or even in uh, later years. So we have been looking very closely at the effects of uh, climatic factors and fetal growth. And this is the work that uh, Michael Jung uh, did, and we published this in uh, the International Journal of Epidemiology last year. Uh, so here we used ultrasound measurements, uh, the routine measurements that uh, we have in, in every pregnancy visit by parietal diameter, head circumference, femur length, abdominal circumference, in addition to birth weight. And we had uh, around 9,500 births uh, coming from Beth Israel Deaconess Medical Center. And uh, we classified these uh, ultrasounds. So here, this graph, you see we have uh, four different uh, ultrasound measurements, and we have three different uh, 
um, the three different times where ultrasound happened. So early ultrasounds, ultrasounds in mid-pregnancy and ultrasounds in late pregnancy. And what we observed was that the brain parameters, especially by parietal diameter, uh, is vulnerable to the effects of, of temperature. So here we see uh, these are the effects that are showing the uh, exposure to temperature in uh, during pregnancy uh, in the x-axis and we see the z-score of the measurements in the y-axis. So we see that early exposure to increased temperatures is associated with smaller biparietal diameter in early pregnancy, and this effect can be seen both in mid-pregnancy and late pregnancy. We saw a similar uh, picture in head circumference, so we see that uh, higher exposures, uh, exposures to higher temperatures are associated with lower, um, uh, smaller, head circumference, uh, both in early, mid, and late pregnancy. And we did see um, some effects in femur length and abdominal circumference. And now we are expanding this work. So we are looking on whether, you know, we do not really know if these um, effects are clinically significant. So we do not know if they translate into specific neurodevelopmental delays. So uh, we now are looking at large cohort study coming, uh, studies coming from claims data using um, the um, uh, the Medicaid um, uh, population to begin with uh, in association with the Brigham and Women's Hospital to look on whether exposure in climatic factors and air pollution during pregnancy is associated with certain neurodevelopmental delays. We have been also expanding this work. Uh, uh, this is uh, Katie Senegal. She's a master's student at the epidemiology department, and she's doing her thesis on looking at fetal growth as an outcome, but now we are looking at climatic factors and air pollution mixture exposure. So this is um, a more comprehensive assessment of all the air pollutants and all the climatic factors that uh, uh, people are exposed to during pregnancy and how uh, these correlated exposures, uh, what are the effects after taking all this complex correlation into account? And this is very preliminary data. So here are the results for femur length at uh, 16 to 23 weeks of pregnancy, and we see the results of uh, temperature, particulate matter, um, uh, nitric dioxide, and humidity. So we do see similar picture of the associations that we have been um, uh, seeing in the previous analysis, but there are some interesting things to, to see. Again, temperature effects were very, very strong. Humidity effects were uh, not expected, but we are looking into it and see why humidity is so important in this analysis. But there are other outcomes that we should be thinking about. And uh, we were um, um, kind of um, um, not happy, I wouldn't say happy, but it was very interesting to see the director's corner from NICHD. Um, and there were uh, reports uh, uh, about addressing the tragedy of stillbirth. So stillbirth as an outcome is an outcome that has not been um, studied enough. Um, and the, uh, the statistics are not in favor, specifically for some uh, populations. And again, underneath that, we saw that another uh, pressing topic for, for NICHD would be addressing the health effects of climate change. So um, we were already doing this work when this NICHD director's corner report um, came out. So uh, this is a, a paper that we also published uh, last year uh, regarding climatic factors, air pollution, and stillbirth. And we looked at uh, short-term exposure to uh, these factors and the risk of stillbirth using a time-stratified uh, case crossover design. So here you see, this is the work uh, uh, that Matt Shapler did. He's a postdoctoral fellow at the T32 training grant in perinatal epidemiology that the department has. And these are the results from the time-stratified uh, study on the x-axis, there is the lag uh, of zero to seven days exposure, and uh, we have the risks in the y-axis. And these results are stratified by race because we did see uh, important, we had important findings when we stratified by, by race. So uh, an association between daily PM2.5 concentrations and stillbirth uh, was found among the black individuals uh, in the cumulative lag, so all the days of, of exposure, uh, but we didn't see the same pattern in other races and ethnicity. And uh, for temperature, we did not see much, so temperature in the short-term exposure doesn't seem to be uh, significant, but 
uh, the results were even um, um, more pronounced when we stratified the, uh, the Black population by socioeconomic status. So we saw that within the Black population, socioeconomic status was indeed um, uh, a factor that uh, was um, making the estimates much more uh, pronounced. So it was an interesting investigation of uh, how um, when we stratify by race, instead of just treating it as a confounder, we can have much more insight into our results. And also we have been using data from other parts of the world. So we this is Cyprus, this is in the Eastern Mediterranean. So we published a, a paper last year uh, that was the uh, thesis project of uh, Serena Liu. I didn't find the picture, so I couldn't put her in this slide. Uh, and we uh, examined uh, the association between climatic factors, temperature and humidity, and birth weights. And we did find two sensitive windows of exposure, one in the beginning of pregnancy and one at the end of pregnancy for, um, for mean temperature. We did not see much for humidity or uh, temperature and um, humidity variability. So um, evidence is accumulating regarding the effects of uh, climatic factors in different pregnancy outcomes. In some cases, we did see that the climatic factors have stronger effects even uh, from the well-established air pollution risk factors that have been studied before. Uh, but I just want to highlight uh, that pregnancy is, um, is a very special period to study. Uh, and it's a complex period to study. And the reason why it is so complex is because um, when a pregnancy is attempted, um, there are four mutually exclusive uh, outcomes that can happen. So the first one would be a failure to conceive. So there is a selection process there. Not all uh, pregnancies, attempted pregnancies or non-attempted pregnancies end into a conception. Then after that, we can have a pregnancy that results in a, a clinical pregnancy loss, uh, including both spontaneous abortion and stillbirth, uh, miscarriages early in pregnancy and stillbirths later on. Then we can have a pregnancy that results in a preterm birth, which is defined as a live birth occurring at um, or before the 37 weeks of gestation. And we can uh, finally have a pregnancy that is resulting in a full term birth defined as a live birth occurring after 37 weeks of gestation. So um, when we are investigating risk factors for, for pregnancy, um, sometimes we need to take all these um, transition states into account. And this is a graph that exactly describes this transition states. And this is uh, from a work that was published um, uh, recently and uh, from Sebastian Hanus. So starting from a non-clinically recognized pregnancy, um, so if, if there is a person of reproductive age, at some point there can be an active pregnancy. And as I said, there is a large selection there uh, of the pregnancies that actually uh, make it to being an active pregnancy. And then we have uh, certain probabilities for the three outcomes that I just described, having a clinical pregnancy loss, having a preterm birth, or having a full-term birth. So um, this is what is called the multi-state uh, framework, where we uh, would like to have the full picture of what is happening. We may want to calculate all these probabilities for the different transition states to have an accurate representation of what happens uh, from the beginning until the end of pregnancy. And we applied that, um, the same concept of uh, um, um, transitioning from one state to the other uh, by uh, using the semi-competing risks framework. And this was the work that Harrison Reeder uh, published last year in the American Journal of Obstetrics and Gynecology. It has the same concept. It's not about, uh, um, you know, uh, specifically climatic risk factors, but if you want to uh, look at risk factors for preeclampsia as an outcome, the way that someone, um, uh, a person can be diagnosed with preeclampsia is a little bit more complicated than just a binary prediction of yes and no. So uh, if we discuss about risk factors, um, most of the uh, existing literature is using a, what we call a binary risk prediction. So you start from 20 weeks where you become eligible to be diagnosed with preeclampsia uh, 
and then you either have preeclampsia or not have preeclampsia. But things are a little bit more complicated than that. So uh, what we proposed in this paper and how we thought about the structure of the um, hazard ratios is that starting from the 20 weeks, then you can transition to being diagnosed with preeclampsia. And then subsequently, you go from having preeclampsia to deliver. And these are distinct hazards that lead from one state to the other. Or in a population, someone can enter the 20 weeks gestation mark and deliver without having preeclampsia. So this is another way to uh, incorporate all the complexity that uh, lies when you're trying to um, estimate a phenomenon, an adverse pregnancy outcome. And I think given this complexity of the selection processes that happen along the way and the different hazards of transitioning from one state to the other, if we ignore all those things, we can have resulting biases. So I'm going to discuss about a few of them. Uh, this is not by any means uh, an exhaustive list of the biases that can occur, but these biases can happen because we ignore some of the states that happen from the beginning until the end of pregnancy, and they are very much associated with time varying exposures, just like the ones that um, climate, climatic factors that we are studying. Um, these are the nature of the climatic factors, um, risk factors. So starting from the fixed cohort bias, uh, this is very common when we are doing a birth registry um, um, studies using the birth registries. So this graph here shows how the population at risk changes according to the birth date using uh, birth cohorts. So let's say we have all the births that happened in 2004, 2005, 2006, and 2007, and we want to study the um, births that happen from January 1st, 2005 until um, December 31st, 2005. So for the full year. And we know here we see uh, these groups of pregnancies are uh, pregnancies that were conceived on the same date. So here we have conceptions that happened before the start date of the study. Here we have conceptions that happened in the date of the study, in, within the date of the study. And here we have pregnancies that were conceived close to the end of uh, the pregnancy. And with the gray arrows, we see that studies that do not make it in our sample size and with the black arrows, we see the studies that are included in our analysis. And we can see here that, for example, that for pregnancies that were conceived before the start of our, um, our study, a pregnancy that ended in 19 weeks is not going to make it uh, in our final sample. And this is even uh, more important when we are looking at time varying exposures. So let's say we want to, um, let's assume we want to examine all births registered uh, between January 1st, 2001 and December 31st, 2001. And let's focus on, um, so we want to look at this uh, time frame. And here we have two pregnancies that were both conceived in June 2000. So it is very reasonable to assume that some of these pregnancies are going to end at a stillbirth. So uh, stillbirth pregnancies are going to end before the start of the follow-up, and pregnancies that do not end in a stillbirth are going to be included in our sample. And the reason for that is that we know that the mean gestational age for stillbirths is around 28 weeks, and the main mean gestational age for live births is around 38 weeks. So um, a study that ended in uh, a stillbirth is not going to be included in our, our sample. Now, why is that important? That is important because uh, this means that first trimester exposures during June 2000 may look remarkably protective as the number of stillbirths would be very small. And the bias for a study of, let's say, temperature and stillbirth would, still de then, would then depend on what exposure occurred in June 2000 and what the true association is. So if it was a month with a particularly high level of exposure, June 2000, this would bias any true association between pollution and stillbirth towards the NAD. And if there is no association between uh, temperature and stillbirth, then the bias would be towards a false finding of a protective effect. And again, the bias, we demonstrate here how the bias can function in the beginning of pregnancy, 
but it's exactly the same at the end of the cohort with the longer pregnancies being missed and the shorter pregnancies being captured. So um, we really need to have this into account, especially when we are evaluating the effects of um, exposures that vary over time, like temperature, like even if we want to look at seasonality. And there is a fairly simple way to avoid this bias. If we exclude, if we are doing a case control study, for example, uh, if we exclude the cases and control subjects with estimated conception date, let's say 20 weeks, no, you know, according to what was the shortest gestation in our data set before the data collection started or 43 weeks before it ended, assuming that the longest gestation in our data set was uh, 43 weeks. That ensures that the exposures examined during the gestation period would equally apply to the cases and controls if we're doing a case control study. Of course, we do lose some of the sample size, uh, but again, given that this is a very prevalent uh, bias in studies that have to do with birth certificates, sometimes the sample size is enough that we cannot, um, we do not uh, lose too much information. And it's supposed to be around 5%. Another associated bias with what I just described is what we call a live birth bias. Um, and this has been studied uh, by Michael Lung and Mark Weisskopf uh, in a simulation study. And briefly, there are two possible mechanisms for live birth bias. Um, uh, one is conditioning on a collider and the other is the depletion of susceptibles. So for live birth bias with a collider type structure, two conditions need to hold. The first is that the exposure of interest is related to pregnancy loss. So here we have our exposure A um, and uh, S is conditioning on, on live births. And then we have our outcome that we study. And we have a, an, another exposure that is associated both with pregnancy loss and with the outcome of interest. So if this second variable exists that separates, uh, it, which is separate from the exposure of interest that is related both to pregnancy loss and the outcome of interest can create a non-causal pathway between the exposure A and the outcome Y via by, the, by definition conditioning pregnancy loss and the unmeasured common causes. And the second type of live birth bias occurs when the exposure of interest preferentially results in the fetal loss of those fetuses that are more susceptible to the outcome of interest or early pregnancy loss among the pregnancies that would have resulted in such susceptible fetuses. These me mechanisms could be, um, we could address them in a statistical analysis uh, if there are available data on pregnancy loss in the study population. Most of the times uh, we do not uh, because early pregnancy losses are never detected. This is why uh, this study was so important because uh, by simulations uh, and uh, depending on the strength of the association between the different variables, uh, the authors were able to uh, evaluate how much um, bias we were expected to see uh, in any case of the strength of the associations. Another um, very prevalent bias in uh, perinatal epidemiology is conditioning on intermediates. And that has been um, um, uh, presented uh, by Sonia Hernandez Diaz in this uh, 2006 paper with the birth weight paradox. Uh, so the issue of conditioning on intermediates is also um, uh, is, is very is very prominent, as I said, in perinatal epidemiology. As investigators very often want to condition on intermediate variables that may be important drivers of an association of interest. This issue gained the attention with the birth weight paradox. Um, and Sonia Hernandez Diaz showed that uh, conditioning on birth weight um, and potential intermediate for the effect of smoking on infant mortality induces what we call the collider bias, leading to an inverse association between smoking during pregnancy and infant mortality among the low birth weight infants. So in the low birth weight infants, uh, uh, smoking seemed to be protective uh, in uh, infant mortality, which didn't make sense in the beginning. So conditional, it's the same thing when we are conditioning on gestational age, it carries the same implications and could also lead to collider bias, an issue that has been identified in the literature for quite some time. 
And that is because researchers often conceptualize gestational age as a confounder, even though it can be a potential mediator of the exposure outcome relationship of interest if the exposure affects the timing of birth in addition to the outcome of interest. And this is this is prevalent in uh, the environmental epidemiology um, field. We have seen that most environmental exposures, including air pollution, um, temperatures, um, higher temperatures, um, do affect uh, the gestation duration. So they have been associated with uh, how long the pregnancy lasts. So uh, although the attention uh, paid to the issue of this overadjustment and potential for collider bias has begun to shift common practice in perinatal epidemiology, there are many recent studies that still employ some kind of conditioning, maybe not adjusting for the gestational age specifically, but many of them restrict the sample into term births or some standardization of the outcome. So that is still a, a prevalent, uh, uh, this is a problem that still exists. So in general, the researchers must consider the question of interest and assumptions needed before deciding whether conditioning on an intermediate is necessary. So, such an adjustment will definitely remove some of the effect of interest or introduce potential collider bias, as we have described before, by opening the pathway between the exposure, the intermediate, and the unmeasured common causes. Now, if the total effect of interest, or the total effect is of interest, then it may be important not to condition. It's important not to condition on the intermediate variables. If a specific pathway is of interest, the effects are not mediated through particular mediators, then that should be explicitly stated and um, uh, stated in the goals of, of this research. And now we have very uh, advanced mediation analysis that can actually highlight uh, the different pathways that can lead from, from the exposure to the outcome, important findings about the mediators, and what of the effect of the exposure to the outcome is can be attributed to the mediator. So we do have uh, methods to address um, intermediate variables if this is uh, of interest, but just um, adjusting for uh, the gestational age or birth weight in such analysis can lead to serious bias. Um, another important uh, variable that is very commonly adjusted for in the models, and I saw the showed the stratification results from our own analysis previously, is race and ethnicity. So this is uh, uh, in this. Uh, slide we see um, uh, on the left hand side of the slide, we see um, a graph that shows uh, it's from a recent analysis in the Lancet Regional Health about the black and white disparities in maternal vulnerability and adverse pregnancy outcomes. We see that indeed um, black uh, women were more exposed to harmful conditions for physical health, uh, for mental health and substance abuse, uh, socioeconomic determinants and physical environment. And then we see that counties with higher than average black populations scored higher in vulnerability than counties with higher than average white populations. And there are different, you know, we can see from the maps that there are many um, marked geographic differences with areas with black overrepresentation and high risk concentrated in the South, where areas with white overrepresentation and high risk predominated in areas like Arkansas, Missouri, Indiana, Kentucky. In the USA, there are um, many unchanging uh, racial disparities in maternal and infant morbidity and mortality, and therefore, therefore, very careful consideration of race and ethnicity is warranted in perinatal epidemiology. Um, researchers should conceive of race and ethnicity as integrating social position, material resources, culture, experiences of racism at the interpersonal level at the struct and structural racism, rather than just conceptualizing race and ethnicity as a biologic variable that causes adverse prenatal outcomes. Uh, unfortunately, many studies mechanically include maternal race and ethnicity as a variable in regression models without really stating the purpose of this adjustment. Um, and this has been detrimental in the clinical setting um, since race and ethnicity has been incorporated into prediction models, for example, for vaginal birth after cesarean section. And uh, that model uh, provided a measure of risk of attempting vaginal delivery after a C-section, taking uh, patient race as an input. And it has been shown that um, uh, 
black women have lower risks of success, lower chances of success uh, in vaginal birth after a C-section. And that can really affect clinical practice where uh, more insightful investigations did not happen. And lastly, I would like to take a few minutes to discuss about what we call the immortal time bias, uh, which is uh, happening um, when an exposure is time varying. So people can move in and out of the exposure states during the course of the study. And if the exposure status of this person time is inaccurately attributed or misclassified, immortal time bias can be introduced. Uh, so when studying pregnancy outcomes, this can occur if exposure uh, states the change over the course of the gestation, but are represented in the analysis as though they are fixed at baseline. A classic example of the immortal time bias is seen here, um, where uh, uh, investigators were trying to see if gestational diabetes is a risk factor for, uh, for stillbirths. But here, as we can see uh, in this graph, the screening for gestational diabetes happens around 24 to 28 weeks of pregnancy. This is the gestational age distribution of the stillbirth. This is where gestational diabetes is happening. And this is where um, uh, stillbirths happen after the 20 weeks of pregnancy. So there may be events uh, that are happening in this area of the graph that uh, happen before someone has the opportunity to be diagnosed with gestational diabetes. And understanding where pregnancy complications or other time varying exposures such as gestational you know, such as gestational diabetes is just an example, increase the risk of stillbirth is very important. Um, so insufficient consideration of this immortal time can result in large biases, potentially even reversing the direction of the association. It is therefore very important to account for this when studying time varying exposures in the pregnancy context. And several analyses and design choices can mitigate this bias due to immortal time. Um, some researchers either define the exposed and unexposed groups based on the exposure status at enrollment, following what we call the target trial approach, in which alignment of eligibility, exposure assignment, assignment and follow-up time in an observational study mimics a randomized trial. Or other solutions for the immortal time bias is to create a landmark time during which exposure status is determined. And a landmark time is a window during which exposure is measured, which is really very early in the follow-up time. And then any births or pregnancy losses that occur during that time are considered censored. And those participants are excluded from the subsequent analysis. Um, when the exposure window is pregnancy, then the landmark period is often the first 20 weeks of gestation, which corresponds to the earliest week of gestation in which both fetal deaths and live births tend to be recorded in, in birth records. And here, uh, uh, another solution is to use a hazard ratio using uh, a Cox model and modeling the exposure as time varying uh, covariates. I'm not going to go into the details of how we do that, but this is something that has been proposed as a solution before. So we really need to think about um, the uh, exposure um, time that every participant spends in our study and to classify it um, uh, appropriately. So I will um, end by saying that we see that extreme cohort attrition occurs between conception and birth, and we really should be thinking about that and taking into account. The pregnancy duration is delimited, so the uh, uh, events that happen uh, before the start of the follow-up in our, our study and what we capture in the beginning of the follow-up and in the end of the follow-up is, is very important. Assessing exposures in mother-child pairs rather than the typical single unit gives rise to very special cases of bias, and I didn't even discuss about what happens when you want to do childhood follow-up, which is even more complicated. So I hope I persuaded you that perinatal epidemiology is an especially challenging field to infer causal effects of potentially modifiable exposures of interest, and observational studies of perinatal outcomes will always have uh, limitations, but we really need to do a better job improving the evidence base since uh, randomized trials in this setting is just not possible. So I want to thank you very much. And